what is the best way to navigate it from a portfolio investment perspective? So I'm primarily sticking to a diversified approach. I, I call it the three pillar portfolio, which is basically one pillar is cash equivalents, um, you know, uh, money markets, T-bills, things like that. Another pillar would be equities, just long-term compounding equities, being able to absorb that volatility. And then the third would be commodities and hard monies. Um, it's more of the inflation component. Um, from a more tactical standpoint, if, if someone's trying to trade around this, which is more challenging, I think the, the kind of prevention there is to somewhat be defensive until you see signs that maybe the liquidity profile is improving. So if, if, if you start to see that the Federal Reserve is going to end their quantitative tightening, or you see some sort of realization that they're starting to cause problems in the treasury market and they reverse course, that'd probably be a buying opportunity. But I think until you see signs um, of liquidity kind of stabilizing after this debt ceiling, I think it's worth being defensive. Okay. And the best way to be defensive? Probably focusing on money markets um, because you have cash equivalents without much counterparty risk and your biggest counterparty is the Fed rather than the Treasury that might ironically temporarily default on you. Um, so I think money markets are pretty attractive. Um, and I think in general, just diversification. So having defensive equities, um, I've been pointing out things like energy pipelines, for example. If someone doesn't want the volatility of the producers, um, I think a number of the, the highest quality pipelines mm -hmm. are actually pretty attractive in this environment. They've kind of washed out a lot of their um, leverage. Um, their valuations are cheaper. So I think more income focused kind of recession resistant businesses along with money market exposure is a good way to kind of be defensive until you see signs of a liquidity chain. When you look at the position of the U.S. dollar, there is a trend of de-dollarization. So it may not be a threat to the U.S. now. It may not be a threat to the U.S. for the next 10 years. But broadly speaking, we are seeing the dollar perhaps start to lose its place as the king of reserve currencies. We're seeing other countries conduct trade with their own currencies largely as a result or partly as a result of the dollar being weaponized following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So we're seeing a number of countries trade amongst themselves. And we also have uh, the BRICS countries looking to launch uh, their own global reserve currency, a global reserve asset, uh, potentially backed by commodities or basket of commodities still to be determined that meeting's happening in August in South Africa. How do you see this de-dollarization trend impacting Bitcoin in the near term and in the long term? So I, I think in the near term, de-dollarization is probably overstated. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier to say something like, you know, it's easier for BRICS nations to say we're going to do something than to actually agree on it, build it, make it credible and start using it at, at significant volumes. So, uh, I, you know, we've seen kind of a, a period of de-dollarization. Um, I think the long term trend towards de-dollarization is clear. Um, basically this this kind of period is somewhat unnatural to begin with if we, if we have a country with five percent of the world population but we're responsible for like 90 percent of international uh, currency swaps um that's kind of a long-term unsustainable situation anyway we've seen for example the, as india and china um and the BRICS nations in general become a larger percentage of global gdp um than the g7 eventually um, that does result in an inherently more multipolar world and that necessitates a multipolar currency world and a multipolar payments world so that one country can't just shut off payment systems yeah. of a country that's actually in some ways larger than itself. It wouldn't make sense. Um, in the near term, you know, I think some of these moves are, while they're happening, I think people might overstate the speed of them happening. So for example, de-dollarization is not really a big theme for my, say, one to two year Bit Bitcoin outlook, but I think it does factor into, say, a five plus year um, Bitcoin outlook. I think that Kind of like how when you have de-dollarization, there's more interest in central banks uh, in gold right. as yeah. an asset. Record I, buying, yeah. Exactly. I, I think so right now, Bitcoin is generally too small for most sovereigns. Um, you, you have some smaller ones like uh, Kingdom of Bhutan that's mining Bitcoin. Um, they're able to kind of get into that space, but you generally it's not large enough to be a really a sovereign reserve asset. I think if you have an, uh, another couple cycles of Bitcoin growth and you add to its market capitalization, to its liquidity, reduce its volatility, I think it could become a relevant sovereign reserve asset for some of these countries that want more independent, unsanctionable reserves that they can also use as unsanctionable payments. Um, so I do think that Bitcoin is one of the solutions they can turn to, but right now it's 
except for the smallest countries, is still in many ways too small for these, these bigger sovereigns to fully take it seriously. We have seen uh, Liechtenstein, and admittedly a very small country as well, uh, saying that they are open to adding Bitcoin to their reserves and accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment now. Uh, but you're saying if we were to take a, a 10-year outlook, if that is indeed your time frame, do you see Bitcoin being owned by central banks in 10 years' time? 10 years' time, I do. I, do. I, think, I think it starts with the smaller ones. And it also starts with any of these small countries that not only maybe want to hold Bitcoin, but they want to signal to Bitcoin companies that they're a friendly jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, so whether it's El Salvador or um, Switzerland or, um, you know, Liechtenstein or Dubai or Singapore, whatever the case may be, these smaller um, countries can say, we're a neutral ground. Um, we're conducive to working with you. If, for example, the United States makes it a pretty hostile place, um, then they can gather some of that business. So I think there will be probably havens those havens might grow in size or, or kind of medium-sized havens might also want to enter that market. But I think as you get a, a decade in the future, I wouldn't be surprised to see larger sovereigns um, own Bitcoin. And what does this mean for gold? Because you mentioned gold, and we do know that central banks have been buying a record amounts of gold in this BRICS country, a, a currency potentially backed by gold, as uh, the reports are indicating. What's your outlook then for gold? So I'm pretty constructive on gold with, say, a five-plus-year period. Um, I, I think as we enter um, what I think is going to be another commodity cycle, um, I, I think gold will be part of that commodity cycle of higher commodity prices, um, generally more inflationary conditions coming in waves. So maybe not inflation in the next six months, but I think in the 2020s decade, we'll probably see more rounds of pretty significant inflation. Um, and I think that you know gold is likely to end this decade um, probably notably higher then than it is now. Um, but I do think that it'll reach a lower level than it would if Bitcoin didn't exist, right? Because now instead of gold and to a lesser extent silver being the only kind of escape routes, um, I think now Bitcoin is is kind of competing with that. And it kind of, if, if the same total market flows into these assets, it's now flowing into a greater number of assets. And so it kind of fractures. So I do think that I would expect Bitcoin to have better returns and to take some of the monetization that gold would otherwise have mm -hmm. for itself. You did say that you're comfortable seeing Bitcoin at six figures by the end of 2025. Let's use that same timeline for your gold forecast then. I expect to see it breaking out of this current kind of triple top that it's been struggling with. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, mid 2000s. Um, by that point, you know, maybe 23, 24, 2500. Um, there are certain, I mean, there's all sorts of potential outcomes in the war that could affect this. So this is one of those things, there's a very large range of outcomes, mm -hmm. but I do expect to see most likely my base case would be a, a breakout above this kind of 2000, 2100 ceiling that it's been struggling with and to be higher than that. How much higher than that? I would hopefully like to see it in the mid 2000s, um, but it's, you know, there's so many variables that go into play. I think basically it's, I, I try to think directionally rather than in terms of price targets, mm -hmm. um, because at any given time, there's a number of assets that can be in my portfolio. Right. And while it's very hard to predict what levels are going to be at, instead I try to predict which ones are going to outperform others on a risk adjusted basis. And I think gold scores pretty well in that regard. It, it's more attractive than a number of other assets I want to own. And I do think it'll be higher. I'm just very hesitant to say how high in a specific time frame.